But and today I want to talk first about Australia Day celebrations. The process activity this year was a little bit less than usual, but I suspect that's because coronavirus and bushfires were taking our attention. And it was there as usual, this anti-Australia Day protest, which I'd like to dr drill into just for a minute. The day has come and gone, the protest movements were seen, and I say movements plural for good reason, because there are actually several strands within this protest movement that I want to pull out. The first one is that there's people who argue for a change of the date, and that's it. They just say, look, it's insensitive to have it on this day. Aboriginal people don't like it. Let's change the date. And that's the end of the matter. But then there's those who actually go a little bit further and they say, well, actually, we shouldn't even celebrate an Australia Day full stop because there's nothing to be celebrated about post-white settlement Australia. Um, and so they go a little bit further and there you see a slightly broader uh, undermining of Australia. And then you go to the next level, which is people who say, well, not only should we not celebrate anything, but instead we should have a national day of mourning and we should lament what has happened. And so they go further than that. And there's hashtags on Twitter to suit your preferred sort of brand. You can have hashtag change the date, hashtag abolish Australia Day or hashtag invasion day or even further actually hashtag always will be, which refers to the slogan always was, always will be Aboriginal land, which says we should give it all back. Um, I'm not sure how that would work, but there you go. Give it all back. There's normally some symbolism from somebody to suit each of those narratives. I won't go through the list. I've got them here, but the whole bunch of uh, city councils or town councils over the last uh, few years have come out and made different statements of symbolism, abolishing Australia Day ceremonies, changing citizenship ceremony dates, um, you know, passing various motions through council to say, you know, um, uh, that Australia Day is to be condemned or that we should be mourning instead and things like that. Um, and uh, there's all of that stuff that goes on and it goes on, seems to grow in strength every year, although slightly blunted by other matters this year. But then there's other things that flow out as well. Um, you look, for example, last year, 2019, there was, um, there was a protest against the Australian national anthem. Uh, and I think it was a schoolgirl, Harper Nielsen, who refused to stand for the national anthem at her school. And uh, as a result of that, there was headlines all around the country. And, and other things are flowing out of that. You often get sports stars, singers and things like this protesting the national anthem. And so you see there's something beyond the day and more into other national symbols. Um, but then if you go and look at a lot of these protest movements and you read the placards at the protests, or if you search the Twitter hashtags that I just mentioned before and you read the tweets, you see broader themes coming through. You see themes in there which object actually not to say Australia Day, but object to what they call colonialism. Now, colonialism to me is sort of a, a very racist view of the world. Um, but for these people, it's largely, well, it's just the Western edifice full stop. The West, Australia is in its present iteration colonial and therefore needs to be brought down, needs to be radically either overthrown or, or changed and re-engineered and remodeled. So there's a broader society-wide objective in many of these things. And you look at the placards at these protests and you see calls for financial compensation, entering into treaties, more reconciliation work, a lot of things said about past wrongs and reminding everybody of what's happened, the bad things in the past. And here's the thing. For me, the issue is not the date. Uh, you know, you can be agnostic about dates. I, I'm not particularly worried about when holidays are celebrated. If it was just a question of moving it for convenience or moving it out of uh, uh, deference to another group or whatever, and, and, and you still celebrate the day just the same, uh, that's fine. You know, and people say, well, the 26th of January does have a special significance. It's true, but you can find other dates as well. What about the date of federation in 1901? Things like that. You can find... Um, ways and means around that. If I thought that changing the date was the end of the issue, I guess I wouldn't be particularly worried. But I just don't think that's the end of the issue. I th I'm very skeptical that changing the date would end the matter. Um, you know, in politics, there's this thing where a bit of an art of incrementalism. You see it all the time. You know, people want an objective, but they can't necessarily get the whole thing. And so they'll go for 5 percent or 2 percent or even 1 percent, and they'll get that, and then they'll move the goalposts and start agitating for the next 5 percent. And you see it in a lot of political movements. And there's a lot of people behind the Australia Day thing that have further goals. And, uh, you know, Australia Day is not the issue for them. It's actually a far more far-reaching thing with which I have a problem. Uh, and I think many Australians have a, a, a problem with the demands. And, uh, you know, I think uh, changing Australia Day would be progress. A National Invasion Day would be more progress. A treaty with substantial redistribution of land and wealth would be more progress. A special parliament would be more progress. And so on and so on and so on as the great spectre of colonialism, i.e., you know, the way the West is, changes. Um, and that's my concern. It doesn't end. 
you know, you've got on the one hand grievances of the past, and I'm not pretending that they are not there. They are there. There's no doubt about it. I'm not pretending that they're not deeply felt. They are deeply felt. I, I know that. Uh, and, and not for one second actually discrediting those deep feelings or discrediting shameful realities. But the thing is that they are trawled up and dwelt upon and promoted and pushed. And the question I would have is, well, until when? When is enough? And I don't know that there's an answer to that question. On the other hand, you've got Australia and her heritage that is presented only through the lens of wrongs and therefore is denigrated as a whole when that's overblown. But nonetheless, the presentation is that there's nothing good in it and we have to reject it. And I say, well, for how long? At what point do you say, well, that's, that's enough? When does it end? And, you know, uh, when do apologies count? Um, you know, you can apologize once, twice, six times, 10 times. You can have a national day of apology that exists in perpetuity. And I say, well, when's the problem resolved? There's no resolution. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. There's no answer. And the reason there's no answer is because none of these things can take us back to the 18th century. None of these things can erase history that is written in the history books for all time hitherto. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's no answers in terms of actually changing the past because the past can't be changed. See, the thing is we're all here today. Nobody Nobody for the best will in the world, for the greatest desire and longing in the world can change the bad bits of the past because they happened. You know, we can say sorry. And I guess I felt at one stage, well, why would I say sorry for something that I didn't do? It was in the history. But then I go, well, you know, maybe if it's going to be helpful and, and, and we've got to, you know, um, do this and, and maybe do it as a reminder to ourselves of, of how we should live from here on. Well, all right, let's do that because it might solve the problem. And, it, you know, maybe there's some good in it. But, but the question is, well, does sorry change the past? Well, it hasn't. And when is it enough? See, what do you do with wrongs that cannot be undone? What do you do with a past that's etched forever into history? And there is only one answer to that question. One answer, as far as I can tell, and I've thought long and hard. And it's the answer that God gives because God had to answer the same question himself. God had to deal with a history of cosmic wrongs and rebellion against him. God had to deal with generations upon generations who lived without him, who were ungrateful to him, who sinned against him and sinned against him and sinned against him. And that history cannot be undone. And not only can it not be undone, but it cannot be ignored because justice is real. And if justice is to be done, you cannot ignore wrong. So how does he deal with it? And the answer is Jesus Christ. I've long thought about this and I wanted to give a at one stage, a secular answer, uh, an answer that the viewers who are not Christians can go, yeah, yeah, that's right. But you know what? There is no secular answer to this conundrum. This is an answer that has been brought into the Judeo-Christian cultural heritage that, you know, the West has largely embraced in, in, in recent centuries, the idea that forgiveness is a thing, the idea that it is possible because we saw that in Christ as the one and only way to deal with wrongs that cannot be undone, the way of repentance and forgiveness. Where on the merit of our repentance alone, well, on the merit of Jesus Christ, but because of our repentance in terms of our action, removing our sins as far as the east is from the west and choosing to remember them no more. That's how the Bible puts it. And that's just as well, because there's nothing we can do about the past. We can say sorry, and we can change the future and we can mean it and we can work towards it. And that's all we can do. And that's good enough for him. And I praise God for that. So, you know, those who stir up persistent and unending narratives of victimhood and grievance on the one side or call for unending reparations and self-loathing by the other are out of step with the way of Christ. His answer is different. And I know this is hard. But his answer is a clean slate because there is no other way to have hope. And as our culture becomes less Christian, the possibility continues to slip further away that that can ever happen. And division continues to grow because far from being forgotten, the wrongs of the past continue to be remembered and remembered and remembered. 
And I'm aware of how outrageous it sounds in the modern context that this would be what we do. But that sense, I guess, has made me realize afresh how amazing forgiveness is. And forgiveness is something that Christ brought into the world, and especially the fact that I've been forgiven. And then we're told, look, you've been forgiven as your heavenly Father has forgiven you, so forgive others. And we're supposed to model that into the world. And I'm aware that it's so hard, but Jesus was the ultimate pioneer of re reconciliation and it was hard for him. He showed the way he set the foundation and it was hard. That sounds weird to say, but it was hard for him. It really was. You look at him in the Garden of Gethsemane, that kind of thing, really hard. And it's hard for us. But you know, without it, hope never comes. And I'm so glad that it's not through continued misery over remembered wrongs. It's not through continued demands for penance. It's through a clean slate that God deals with me. And I know that whilst it's that simple, it works out in a more complicated way. And a lot of our struggles in this life are just about accepting that and working it out in our life. And, you know, there's a messy kind of way in which that happens. Um, uh, but it doesn't change the fact that that's the foundation. And I get it, there might be a messy way in which this has worked out. But if we were standing on a foundation of the possibility of reconciliation through forgiveness, through that amazing statement of Christ, I remember your sins no more, and to move on in hope together, well, that would be remarkable. And frankly, that's the only answer I know. And I'm so glad that's how God dealt with me and that he doesn't deal with me through the alternative, which we see all around us. Because if he did, well, I'd be miserable and I'd be miserable permanently. And for all my faults, I'm sure there are many, I don't think I'm miserable. Hey, one more thing, you know, I've been looking at the metrics and I figured out something. You guys are watching the videos and not subscribing. So please help us out a great deal by hitting the like button and then hitting subscribe, hitting the bell as well so you get the notifications. It helps us out a really great deal and you can click here to see more videos.